The way whales once were is weird. While today we think of whales as enormous seafaring cetaceans, their ancestors were once no larger than wolves. Prior to Darwin's publication, On the Origin of Species, a French naturalist named Jean-Baptiste Pierre-Antoine de Monet Chevalier de Lamarck was the foremost influencer of European biology. His views on how life changed over time are often boiled down to two points, that all matter strives to become more complex and like God over time, and that an offspring will inherit the traits its parent obtained in their life. Both assertions are untrue. The latter is more obvious than the former. If you've ever seen a couple with dyed hair next to their baby, you know what I mean. That baby is not going to have frosted tips just because the parents do. The former is a little more subtle. You can see in images like the famous March of Progress that the misunderstanding that life trends towards humanity is pervasive and persistent. Even the way we teach evolution fails to functionally fight this myth. We're taught that life started as single cells, eventually producing multicellular structures, which diversified into plants and fish, which then eventually migrated to land. While this is all true, it is important to note that there is no cosmic mandate that evolution had to happen this way. This approach often acts as though terrestrial life didn't return to the ocean, but cytology can help us push against the confusion. You may be used to it now, but the fact that whales are mammals is weird. These creatures are so highly adapted to life in the ocean that it's difficult to imagine their ancestors evolving anywhere else. But mammals first arose on land, meaning that at some point in the beluga's evolutionary past lived a terrestrial creature. That creature is named Indohyus. Indohyus is an extinct artiodactyl and the closest non-cetacean relative to modern whales. We know they're related because they share an incredibly unique ear structure called an involucrum. But here's the kicker. Indohyus is barely bigger than a house cat. Having hooves, it's hard to imagine them ever becoming whales, but their relatively high bone density suggests they relied on spending at least some of their time walking under ponds and rivers. From this predictive behavior, we can see the seeds of cetaea beginning to be planted. As time proceeded, some subset of an Indahaya species or a near ancestor began to spend more time in the water, as it was in some way beneficial to the chances of successfully breeding. This subset, through thousands of years of generations and the gentle force of natural selection, became more suited to marine hunting until it became distinct enough from Indahaya to be recognized as its own genus. Pachycetus was slightly more aquatic than Indahaya, but was by no means a modern whale. While it is the first cetacean, it still spent a significant portion of its life on land, likely hunting in shallow marine ecosystems. But already we see cetaea beginning to grow, with Pachycetus being about the size of a wolf compared to Indohyus's house cat size. Again, we see some population of early Pachycetus splitting off from the main group and eventually becoming Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus is where we see the back legs really shift towards the tail, being heavily adapted towards marine locomotion. With this leg movement, its body would drag along the ground more readily than Pachycetus. This fact, coupled with the placement of its eyes, large teeth, and long snout, suggests it held a similar niche to modern crocodilians, ambushing prey in swamps and coasts, splitting its time between the land and the water. We see the legs going back further as the body lengthens and we proceed from Ambulocetus to the genus Cuchicetus. Continuing from them, we see in Dorudon that the leg bones have disconnected from the spine entirely, becoming, for all intents and purposes, vestigial. Dorodon were about 5 meters long, but their coexisting cousin, Basilosaurus, was almost 20 meters long. All through this time, the nasal openings of these cetaceans have been moving closer to the top of their head to allow for easier breathing as, remember, these are still mammals and need to surface despite spending all their time hunting fish in the water. Phylogenetically, from here, we start to reach cetaceans that are extant meaning they're still around. These are either odontoceti or mysticeti. Odontoceti are cetaceans with teeth and include sperm whales, narwhals, belugas, and dolphins. Mysticeti are baleen whales, the filter feeders you usually think of when you hear the word whale. That brings us to today, where the blue whale swims our oceans as the biggest animal to ever exist, even bigger than the brontosaurus. We can see now how cetaceans disprove Lamarck's flawed idea. Whales provide an exciting inversion in the traditional discussion of evolution, and I hope any biology teacher out there will think to slot a bit of cetology into their syllabus.